Equilibrium calculations, including those involving ice tables, going to be the topic in this lesson. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do DAT, MCAT, and OAT prep as well. I'll leave links in the description for where you can find those courses. Now, this is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so the first calculation we're going to take a look at is not going to involve an ice table. It's one of the easier types of calculations, although there's nothing really easy about any of the equilibrium calculations. Uh, and, and one of the bigger parts is just realizing what kind of calculation you've really got to set up and stuff. Is it one of those ice tables, or is it not? And how do you know? Well, we'll definitely cover all of that and more. So we'll start with one of the easier ones. In this case, we're given all three equilibrium concentrations for all three species showing up in this reaction and then just asked to solve for Kc. And so first thing we do is just set up the Kc expression, which in this case is concentration of N2 times concentration of H2 cubed all over concentration of NH3 squared. Cool, and this is a typical setup, and, and again, if this is Kc, it's implied, we don't usually write it in, but again, that means that all of these concentrations have to be measured at equilibrium, so it's implied when we set it equal to, that ratio equal to K. And so in this case, that's exactly what's supplied, all three of those, at equilibrium, and so we just plug them in and we solve for Kc, and this is typical. The other way they could do this, there's really four variables in this equation, I just gotta give you three. I could give you two, any two of the concentrations and the Kc, and ask you to solve for the other concentration, and that's kind of the, the rub here. And so we'll see how this is gonna be different than some of the ice table calculations in a little bit. So, but from here, we're just gonna plug and chug, and so Kc is gonna equal the concentration of N2, so 0.05, times the concentration of H2, 0.001 cubed, all over 0.01 squared. And I'll add the extra zeros back when I'm factoring in sig figs and stuff like this. So uh, and this one you probably could do in your head, because dividing by 0.01 is the same thing as multiplying by 100, and you know you could convert all these to scientific notation or something like that to make your life easy, but uh, if you've got a calculator, by all means, let's just use that calculator. So 0 0.05 times 0 0.001 cubed, and divided by 0 0.01 squared equals 5 times 10 to the negative 7. So which I'll write out. So it's going to be 0 0.123456 zeros followed by a 5. So 5 times 10 to the negative 7. But again, we've, we really had two sig figs in all these, so we'll put an extra 0 on the end there. Or we could have written this as 5.0 times 10 to the negative 7. Either one of those being our correct answer. So again, this is the easier of the situations. Let's take a look at some ice table calculations. All right, so in this next question, so we're dealing with reaction of H2 and Cl2 to produce HCl here, and it says if two moles of both H2 and Cl2 are each placed in a two liter vessel, what will be the equilibrium concentrations of H2, Cl2, and HCl? So we're being asked for equilibrium concentrations. In this case, we're being asked for the equilibrium concentrations of all three. So, and the word initial isn't used, but we've initially placed two moles of both H2 and Cl2 in a two liter container. That's our initial conditions. And this is gonna be the key to, to knowing when you like need to do like an ice table, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, and so we'll find out, we're gonna set up what is known as an ice table. So, and the ice table stands for initial concentration, the change in the concentration, and then the equilibrium concentration, which will just be the initial plus the change. And so uh, you're going to know you're doing one of these ice table problems if you're dealing with both initial and equilibrium conditions. In the last problem we just did, we were only dealing with all concentrations at equilibrium. There was no initial conditions, just the system was at equilibrium. We're provided with all the equilibrium concentrations, calculate the equilibrium constant. It is not an ice table problem. When you've got both initial and equilibrium conditions in the same problem, that's typically when you're going to be using this lovely tool, the ice table or ice chart along the way. Now, in this case, uh, we're given a Kc value and stuff like that. And first thing I want to do is really just set up my equilibrium constant expression here. And so in this case, we're going to have HCl squared all over concentration of H2 times Cl2. And that's what's equal to 16 in this case. And again, it's implied. We never write it, but it's implied. And I say we never write it. Obviously, I'm writing it. But it doesn't have to be written here that these are the concentrations measured at equilibrium. And the problem is we're only given a way of getting the, or the concentrations initially. And so in this case, we're sticking two moles 
of both H2 and Cl2 in a two liter vessel. And so for initial concentrations here, well, initially we didn't actually have any HCl whatsoever, none. We didn't stick any in our vessel, but we did stick two moles of H2 and two moles of Cl2 in a two liter vessel. And technically, if you're gonna set up one of these ice tables, you're either gonna use molarities or partial pressures, depending if you're using KC or KP. If you're using KC, then molarities. And so it's not enough just to do moles here. We're gonna put two moles in two liters for each of these. Now, it turns out if you use one of these ice tables, as we'll see kind of in a minute, um, you can set it up in moles. The problem is, is that moles isn't what's properly gonna belong in one of these KC expressions. The brackets here stand for molarity. And so the idea is that if you can take whatever you're gonna, you know, right, right out of your table and stick it, right, those values right into your equilibrium constant expression, that's kind of the ideal. And so I always set these up with either molarities or partial pressures, whichever is relevant for KC versus KP. All right, so that's why I didn't just put moles here, but two moles over two liters. Uh, in this case, and the key is this, what is related in this one to one to two ratio is how these change. Because for every one of these that, uh, of the H2 uh, and Cl2 that react, and notice they do react in a one to one ratio, you get twice as many HCl. And so how much you start with and how much you end with is not related in a one to one to two ratio, but it's how it changes. Because again, for every one of these and one of these you lose, you're gonna gain two HCLs at the same time. And so this is what's gonna be related. So let's just say that, you know, we lost, we had 10 of these react, 10 molecules. Well, if 10 molecules of this react, then it's gonna need to react with 10 molecules of Cl2 based on the one to one ratio. But you're gonna gain 20 molecules of HCl based on the one to two ratio. And so what if it was 100 molecules? Well, 100 of these would react with 100 of these and produce 200 of these based again on that one to one to two ratio. Well, the key is this, we don't actually know how many of these are gonna react in order to get to equilibrium. Now, in this case though, we do know that this reaction is gonna go in the forward direction to get to equilibrium. So we don't always necessarily know that. And we could figure it out, you know, by looking at Q and comparing Q to K. And when Q is less than K, the reaction needs to go forward. When Q is greater than K, the reaction would need to go backwards and stuff like this. But in this case, we don't have any products at all. The reaction can only go forwards. It actually can't go backwards. Q is effectively zero right now. And so Q has to be less than K. The reaction needs to proceed to the right in the forward direction to get to equilibrium. And so in this case, we're gonna lose some of the H2, lose some of the Cl2, and we're gonna gain some HCl. And the question is how much? Well, I don't know. But I do know this, that however much of these I lose, I gain twice as much, just based on the stoichiometry. And so just like in an algebra class, when you don't know something, you call it X most commonly, and that's what we're gonna do here. And so here, I'm gonna lose an amount X, lose an amount X, but gain twice as much, 2x over here. And so you're gonna have either reactants negative and products positive, or you're gonna have reactants positive and products negative, depending on if the reaction is going forward, like this one, or in reverse and things would be the opposite properly. Although we'll find out that it actually doesn't matter. If you set it up backwards and don't realize which way the reaction is actually going to get to equilibrium, you're still gonna come out with the right answer. So it's not so bad. Uh, and then in front of X, you're always gonna have whatever the coefficient is in the balanced reaction. And that's why it's a one X, one X and two X here uh, for the change. Cool, and so then your initial plus your change equals your equilibrium concentrations. It's however much you start with and then add in however much it ever changed by. You know, if you're going down the road here, uh, you know, at 40 miles an hour and a cat jumps right in front of your car and so you slam on the accelerator, no, the brake, I'm just kidding, gosh, you guys are horrible. So I'm, you slam on the brake, and so all of a sudden your velocity changes by negative 30 miles per hour. So you were doing 40 miles per hour, and it changes by negative 30 miles per hour, so how fast are you going now? Well, now you're going 10 miles per hour, it's just 40 plus the negative 30, and now you're doing 10. Same kind of thing here, you just take the initial concentration, add in the change, and that always adds up to your equilibrium concentration. And so two moles over two liters is one mole per liter, and then plus a negative X is just simply one minus X. That's gonna be your equilibrium concentration. Now notice I don't have an exact numerical value for that yet, but it, whatever X is, I'll be able to plug it in and get a value for the equilibrium concentration for H2. Same thing here, two over two is one molar and one molar plus a negative X is one minus X. And then zero plus two X is two X. 
The whole point in setting up this chart is really what goes in this row in the chart right here, because again, E stands for equilibrium concentrations, and that's what properly belongs in our equilibrium constant expression, the equilibrium concentrations. And so now we don't know any of these three equilibrium concentrations at this point, but we can express them all in terms of a single variable. So without this, you know, we, if we try and express them all here, we'd have three variables and we can't solve for anything, but being able to express them all in terms of a single variable, we can set this up and solve. And so we're gonna get 16 equals, and then HCl here, concentrations 2x, and the formula tells me I need to square it. And then we're gonna have, 1 minus x times 1 minus x, and that's really just 1 minus x squared. I'm going to write this one more time. So we're going to have 2x squared all over 1 minus x squared. And you might be like, well, should we just FOIL this out and stuff like this? And you can, and then multiply through the other side and get all the terms on the same side. What you're going to find is you've got a quadratic, and well, that kind of sucks. And so some of you might be on the hook for solving quadratics but a good number of you aren't. So especially on an exam. On a homework, sometimes all bets are off. But on an exam, if you've got to set up one of these lovely equilibrium calculations and actually solve a quadratic, I'm not saying it's unheard of, I'm just saying the vast majority don't. So, but if you're in a class that does, my apologies. However, there are really two principal types of calculations that look like it's gonna set up like a quadratic, but you can get around having to do a quadratic. And because of that, even if your professor says you'll never have to do a quadratic on the exam, they can ask you a question like this because there's a way around it. And the key is realizing that you have a perfect square in the numerator and a perfect square in the denominator. And as a result, you can take the square root of both sides. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. And this will reduce down to something that is no longer a quadratic. So the square root of 16 is four, and then square root of 2x squared is just 2x, and square root of 1 minus x quantity squared is just 1 minus x. And now we don't have a quadratic anymore. No, no x is to the power of 2 at all anymore. And so we can solve for x. We'll multiply it by 1 minus x. So we're going to get 4 times 1 minus x equals 2x. And we'll get 4 minus 4x equals 2x. And then I can add the 4x to the other side. And I'm running out of room. But we're going to get 4 equals 6x and then divide by 6 and we'll get x equals 4 over 6, which is 0 0.67. And that's in units of molarity there. Cool. So if you were doing this on an exam and I wrote that exam, you better believe one of my answer choices is going to be 0 0.67 molar. So the problem is that you've done this big long process to solve for this lovely thing and solve for x here. And the thing is, is you're not an algebra class. And the question is to say, solve for x. The question actually said, you know, solve for these equilibrium concentrations. And x is just a stopping point along the way, something we have to do in order to solve for them. But we've got to substitute it right back in here. Now, in this question, I'm asking for all three. But on, the, on an exam, you're probably just going to be solving for one of them. And if you forget, you get all the way here and you think you're done, you might have a nice detractor answer, a wrong answer, you know, in your multiple choice that, that is exactly what x is. But don't get tripped up there. Don't stop there. So in this case, 1 minus 0.67. Uh, this is going to come out to 0 0.33 molar, so is this one. And then 2 times 0 0.67. Uh, notice 0 0.67 is 2 thirds, so this should be 4 thirds, which would be right around 1.33 molar. Or if you use that exact number, 1.34 molar, same diff or at least approximately the same diff. And one thing you can do is you can go back and check your answers now, is you could go back and plug these numerical values right back into here. And lo and behold, if you do, it will equal 16. So just a quick check that, did I do this right? Yeah, if it comes out to your right KC, then yes, you did this right. But big thing here is that we had a perfect square in the numerator and denominator, and we can avoid the quadratic. And so for even with uh, uh, those of you in a class where your professor says, no quadratics for you on the exam, they can still ask you this. And if you don't realize that you can get around the quadratic, you're going to think you had a quadratic, and you're going to go raise your hand and be like, hey, you told me there was no quadratics. Well, yeah, you can get around it on a question like this. Totally uh, something you could be on the hook for. Let's take a look at another. All right, in this last problem here, so we've got lovely reaction here, and we'll deal with uh, these a little bit more in the next chapter, it turns out, with acids and bases, because this guy's an acid. So 
But in this case, we'll look at it very generically in terms of just plain old equilibrium. So, but we're gonna take 0.1 moles of HCN and put it in one liter of water. And then the question is really, what is the equilibrium concentration of H plus? And so in this case, we're starting with some initial conditions. Initially, I stick this in a beaker, but how much do, of this do I have at equilibrium? And so it involves both initial and equilibrium conditions. And again, that's your big evidence. You're probably doing something involving an ice chart or an ice table. And so, and so initially we're sticking 0.1 moles in one liter. And again, I'm putting everything in the ice chart here in molarity because my equilibrium constant expression is gonna be expressed in terms of molarity here. And so in this case, we'll have the concentration of H plus times the concentration of CN minus all over the concentration of HCN. And if you're doing an equilibrium cal calculation, probably the first thing you should do really is set up your equilibrium constant expression. All right, once again though, these concentrations, it's implied that these are all at equilibrium. It doesn't have to be written in like I'm doing there. And the big thing I'm bringing that up in is that whatever goes in this row right here, that's what goes in our expression right here. So the whole point of setting up this ice table is to figure out what the equilibrium concentrations are expressed in t often in terms of a single variable X. All right, so the only thing we stuck in our beaker is HCN. So initially, before this reaction happens, there's none of the H plus and none of the CN minus. And in this case, with no products, only reactants, the reaction has to go forward. Again, effectively now Q is zero. So, and if it's zero, then it's definitely less than K and the reaction needs to proceed forward to get to equilibrium. And so on the reactant side, our change is gonna be negative. Those are gonna get used up, but we'll be producing some products, so they're, changes are gonna be positive. And in this case, with a one to one to one ratio, it's just simply gonna be X's. No two X's, no three X's, none of that sort. Just minus X plus X plus X. And 0.1 over one is 0.1 molar. And 0.1 molar plus a negative X is just gonna be simply 0.1 minus X for an equilibrium value. That's what's gonna get substituted in right here. And then zero plus X here is X. And zero plus X here is X. And those are gonna get substituted here and here. And in this case then, again, we're looking for ultimately equilibrium concentration of H plus. That's the question, which just happens to be X. And so it turns out for this one example, when we finally solve for X, that will be what we're looking for. All right, so if we set this up then, we're gonna get 4.9 times 10 to the negative 10 is equal to X times X, or just simply X squared all over 0.1 minus x, and you got a problem. This is a quadratic again. So you totally got x squared terms. If you really wanted to solve for x, the most proper way to do it would be to multiply both sides by 0.1 minus x, so cancel on this side, but you had it over here, and then combine all the terms on one side and set up a quadratic and solve your quadratic, and that would suck. But that would be the most mathematically correct way to do this. However, again, Many of you are gonna to be told that there's no quadratics on the exam and they could still ask this question on your exam. So how do we get around the quadratic here? Well, the key is realizing that we have a very, very, very small equilibrium constant, 4.9 times 10 to the negative 10. And you should know that when you have such a tiny one that's so much less than one, that this reaction is gonna favor the reactants at equilibrium. So if you notice, we start off with only reactants, no products. But because of our equilibrium constant, we know that when we get to equilibrium, we're gonna have almost only reactants. And so if we start off with only reactants, and when we finally finish, we're gonna have mostly only reactants, well, that tells you that the number of molecules that actually react to form products is gonna be very small. And that means that X is going to be very small. And so when you've got a really small equilibrium constant, then X, it turns out, is gonna to have to end up being really small as well. And that's the key to this. So X is really small. And so here's the deal. When you add or subtract a really small number, it doesn't affect much. So let's just say that, you know what? I'm moving and I'm leaving the US and I'm moving to Australia. So, um, okay, uh, we're gonna find out how insignificant I am in just a second. So when I leave the US, are they gonna feel the need to be like, oh no, we gotta do a new census, Chad left. Let's count the population. 
Uh, no, it was like 330 million before I left, and it's going to be 330 million roughly after I leave. I am insignificant. And the same reasoning, Australia is not going to be like, oh, Chad just got here. Let's do a new census. No, I, I'm insignificant because one person is so much less than the entire populations of either the United States or Australia. Same thing here. We know X is small. Now, if you multiply by a small number or divide by a small number, it has a big impact mathematically. It's only when you add or subtract a small number to a much larger number that it has very little impact. So notice if I took, you know, if I told you I'm going to multiply Bill Gates's, uh, you know, bank account by 0.01. Uh, he's not going to be happy. <laughs> so uh, multiplying by a small number or dividing by a small number will have a large impact mathematically. It's only when you're adding or subtracting. And so here we've got x times x, and I can't do anything about those. They're multiplied together. But here I've got a, a subtraction of x. And the key is if x is significantly smaller than what I'm subtracting it from, in this case 0 0.1, well, then I can just ignore it, and mathematically it won't make much difference. And the idea is this. Usually if you, what you're subtracting here, or in some cases adding, but in this case subtracting, is less than 5% of the number you're actually subtracting it from, then it's not going to make much of an impact on the overall equation if you ignore it. And so in this case, because my equilibrium constant is so small, I know that x is probably going to be really small. And so what I'm going to do is just right off the bat, just say, you know what, I'm ignoring this guy right here. And so if we rewrite this equation now, ignoring that minus x, 4.9 times 10 to the negative 10 equals x squared all over 0.1. It's not the same equation. However, if x is less than, point, uh, uh, less than 5% of 0.1, then it's not a bad approximation. And so in this case, let's figure out what x comes out to. So we'll multiply to the other side by 0.1. In that case, that's going to come out to 4.9 times 10 to the negative 11. That's equal to x squared. And we'll just take the square root of both sides, and then we'll get our calculators. And this one's probably one you could do in your head if you wanted to, but if you got that calculator, by all means, pull it out. So a square root of 4.9 times 10 to the negative 11 equals 7 times 10 to the negative 6. And again, that's in units of molarity for x. Cool. And again, the whole thing we were solving for here was the equilibrium concentration of H+, plus, which just happens to equal X. And so this isn't just X. This is also the answer to this question, the concentration of H+, plus at equilibrium. Cool. Now let's go back and verify one thing. Was this less than 5% of the number we subtracted it from in the end? And by all means, yeah, it's way less than 5%. So if you look at... Uh, we actually work it out. So 7 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 0.1 times 100, and we get that it's actually 0.007%, way less than 5%. Cool. And we avoided the quadratic. And again, if you want to do, you know, the most mathematically, you know, correct way of solving this, the most mathematically exact way of solving this, you'd use a quadratic and you wouldn't ignore that minus x. But if you did that, you'd come out with almost exactly uh, the same value here, 7 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. So, uh, cool. Another example of a place where we can get around the quadratic and where you're expected to be able to know that you can get around the quadratic even if you've been told no quadratics on the exams like a lot of you will be. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, that thumbs up button is the best thing you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems for equilibrium calculations, check out my general chemistry master course. It includes over 1,200 general chemistry questions. A lot of them have video solutions. So if you get stumped, you can see me work out the problems for you. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.